has the the liquor side of the business that we've always seen as this strong, stable business. Are there any kind of key learnings or things that you've used to kind of transpose into the cannabis business and then kind of develop that data unit from a retail perspective? Hey, everyone. Welcome to our latest TDR Cannabis Exclusive. I'm your host, Shad Dales. Thanks for checking in. And yes, we have an exciting podcast here today. All SNDL investors, very, very happy, I would assume, because the day has finally come. After getting lots of comments and emails from you for the past two months, we welcome in the CEO of SNDL, which trades under that on the NASDAQ, under the ticker symbol SNDL, Zachary George, to the podcast. Good to see you, sir. And I think we've got a lot of happy people to see you on the podcast finally. The, the day is finally here. Thanks, thanks to you both for having me. Good stuff. Good seeing you in Chicago a month, month and a half ago, but time flies. Uh, what'd you think of that conference and just the overall health of the industry while you were there? What was the big takeaway for you? You know what? I, I find a lot, a lot of these conferences are somewhat frustrating. Um, you really? still have a complete lack of institutional interest and support in the space. Mm. I think we, you guys have covered that really well, um, you know, on these segments. Exactly. Um, but but that that really makes things challenging to um, to have it be you know time well spent for many pubcos out there. Yeah, well said. Well, I appreciate the obviously the feedback. Uh, I will say too, congrats obviously on your latest earnings. I think a lot of investors were happy. So let's dive into that. We begin with the overall numbers. You posted two hundred and thirty seven point six million dollars for third quarter twenty twenty three compared to two hundred and thirty point five in the third quarter of twenty twenty two. As many you know. You're currently Canada's largest private sector retailer with 170 locations for liquor, operating under three banners combined. Um, you did 151.8 in revenue, which represents a strong and stable number. But cannabis retail posted a 14.1% increase year over year, which is a significant increase. So why the big jump? Like, what are you seeing right now as to why this uh, part of the uh, business model is uh, growing so substantially? Because that's a big number. So thanks, Dad. So on the cannabis retail front, uh, we benefited from really three core drivers. Um, you, you saw organic growth with um, new, well-located um, uh, door openings. We've had some M&A that has impacted our, our network. And then we have ramped up really the second phase of our uh, data program, okay. which has been a, a strong contributor to those results as well. And, um, you know, we're certainly not done there. Um, we're going through our 2024 budgeting process right now, um, just getting ready to present that to the board and we'll have a better idea for our growth expectations in 2024 very shortly. That's good. Um, diving into in that, in that, Anthony. Oh, go ahead, no, go ahead. I was going to say in that data program, I mean, are you, you're, are you, uh, you're, you're talking about consumer loyalty, correct? I'm assuming the data, data driven approach to consumer loyalty and marketing, um, at retail. So that you can actually separate the two, there's definitely strong overlap in the relationship. But as you guys are aware, mm -hmm. in, in Canada, um, we're able to uh, monetize data uh, as a service. Uh, and so okay. we're able to share with LPs um, exactly how uh, they're performing at retail so they can better understand uh, velocities and tailor their offerings to um, you know, better hit the mark with consumers and also improve their okay. own operations. Hmm. Uh, are there any key learnings or anything that is, is, do you, is the, has the, the liquor side of the business that we've always seen as this strong, stable business? Are there any kind of key learnings or things that you've used to kind of transpose into the cannabis business and then kind of develop that data unit from a retail perspective? It, it, it's a great point and it's, it's a longer story, but the shorter version is that our, our liquor team has been, in, uh, been involved in distribution and retail of regulated products for over 20 years. Yeah. And yeah. some of the major themes they've found as that space has become commoditized um, is that um, convenience and um, value offerings really uh, drive success. And so what you've seen is the application of those same uh, concepts into cannabis retail. And uh, they had started with um, just a handful of locations, less than five, and started to run with a discount model. Uh, and that's really how Value Buds was born, and it became a very hated um, okay. name in the space because they started to um, take a lot of business from competitors by being able to operate with uh, narrower gross margins. Uh, and so what you see is a lot of similarity in Canada in terms of product offerings across retail so that the consumer is left with, in some cases, um, very few other variables to look to, and price is certainly one of those. Interesting. 
location wise, how many is it now that you have in Canada? 150. Our total, our total retail network is, is over 360 today and growing. Combined with liquor. What cannab- uh, locations for cannabis alone? How many is it now? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated, it's over 180, but it's a complicated answer because we have a corporate and franchise. Yeah. Yeah. So while we still garner economics, they're not all owned uh, doors. Yeah. You're really starting to see the industry evolve though. Are you not? People are understanding it more. They're understanding products more. Do you think that's why there's a definitely an increase in what you saw in your latest earnings? We, we've had some specific problems that are now being alleviated. So yes, yeah. we're hitting our stride. We're seeing kind of all time margins in liquor. Uh, retail cannabis is growing nicely on the back of a very cohesive approach that's working in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, we inherited some assets on the upstream side where we had exposure to higher cost cultivation. We recently announced our exit of olds, which is going to really drop our cogs um, materially. Yep. And so we're, we're trying to drive uh, a number of changes that will materially impact um, 2024. Yep. But ideally, we leave a bunch of these changes and charges behind in 2023. And you see a lot less noise and a higher quality of earnings uh, in, in the 2024 calendar. Yeah. Interesting you say that because I dive into more numbers. Another big stat was your net loss, which improved by 77.9% compared to the same quarter in 2022. Would you say the improvement in the overall uh, net loss is due to the lack of impairments from the previous quarters? Like, is that a thing of the past? Almost. I would say that we're, we're 2023 is still going to be noisy with these transitions. You have to remember, we just closed the acquisition of Valens in January of this year. Yep. We re- relocated all processing activities in, into Kelowna. So driving higher capacity utilization. We're just putting the, f- the finishing touches on a few key automation projects. Um, but we've, we've substantially completed those moves and we've seen um, uh, the peak and disruption from that. And so we're excited about what we believe will be a seasonal peak in Q4 and a much cleaner uh, 2024 without without the noise you've seen as of late. 2024, big year. Go ahead, Anthony. It's going to be a big year for everybody. I, I mean, so. I know that Sunstream is a big part of the conversation when we're talking about SNDL. Um, and I know that there's you guys are going after some, or part of some really valuable assets right now with SkyMint, with, uh, with Parallel. Um, I mean, well, I guess what's your outlook in the US? And I mean, what, what did, what's your take on the whole regulatory conversation that's going on right now that everyone can't seem to get out of the way of. I mean, are you more so focused on that or more so focused on these assets are on key mar- in key markets, they're kicking ass, let's get them stabilized and scale them and let the regulatory stuff kind of happens when it happens? It, 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 look, it's a, it's a great, great question. Um, we default to the view that no one's come to save us. Okay, so there's there's a lot of really exciting things that are on the horizon that that may or may not occur in a reasonable time frame. Yeah. But we, we don't we can't afford to hold our breath. Um, and in terms of our U.S. exposure, I'd say a couple things. It's a key driver, I think, for uh, not only against the backdrop of really negative sentiment in the cannabis space specifically, but if you look at the setup um, for our platform and portfolio of assets, you can really really look at us on a um, a nav basis or quasi nav basis. Yeah. So when you think about our cash, um, in addition to even just the Sunstream loan portfolio, which has been adjusted um, on a fair market value basis, you're looking at over $700 million of value there, $200 uh, million of which in Canadian dollars is cash. And our market cap recently has been hovering around $500 million Canadian. Right. And that's really giving us no credit whatsoever for, for operating segments in Canada that are doing almost a billion in revenue. So there needs to be some reconciliation there, um, you know, over the, over the long term. But in, in terms of comments around um, our state level exposure, and again, we, we, we cannot engage in plant touching activities. Um, yeah. But if you look through our credit portfolio to those exposures, I would say, you know, are, are we excited about the markets we're in? Yes. Are we excited about performance? Um, and are, are, are these companies firing on all cylinders? Absolutely not. And what I've seen time really? and time again in the U.S. is... It's shocking the number of large scale MSOs doing hundreds of millions in revenue that have not um, leaned in um, and leaned out their operations, um, driven aggressive um, automation of processes. And some of these businesses still rely almost exclusively on uh, manual labor in everything from labeling to even hand twisting joints, which is just never going to work, right? So in some of these markets, I think healthy pricing and margins has has 
given sort of a, 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 false, a false sense of comfort. Um, and uh, they, they need to be ready and preparing for um, much tighter margins, much more competitive pricing in, in the broader landscape. And so um, different, different case studies, for sure, in terms of these individual exposures, you know, in terms of whether you're thinking about a Michigan or a Florida yeah. um, or anywhere else. Um, but we see a lot of opportunity in just great blocking, blocking and tackling, best practices on the manufacturing side, and frankly, some, some retail 101 principles. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Sorry, retail is that? I, mean, oh, I was going to say, what do you mean by that retail 101 principles? Well, if your if your profitability um, is really strong and yeah. your gross margins, EBITDA margins, and free cash flow profile are are um, you know are really clicking, you may not be concerned about your square footage. You may not be concerned about your staffing. You may not be concerned about the number of point of sales um, uh, units you're running. Yeah. Uh, and so we've seen in a in an aggressive market uh, that's highly competitive and arguably has been historically a, a virtual zero profit environment like Canada, Yeah. Um, exactly where some of these sweet spots are. Uh, and so when I look across the US, I see a number of markets that are converging, driven by the same principles. Um, but I think that's gonna change the face of retail and how the consumer accesses these products, these products over the long term. Hmm, that's interesting. Is that, how you're, is that how you're achieving this year over year growth in the Canadian market, Whether which I mean, gets knocked a lot, but I mean, you guys are firing on all cylinders. Yeah. I mean, is it really in those deep rooted principles of retail and automation um, in your vertical operations that are driving those numbers um, now and obviously quarters into the future? I think that's right. And we look, just take a, take a, take a page out of the liquor um, playbook, which is like, yeah. it's nobody's God given right to earn 35 to 50% gross margins in these businesses. Yeah. And as various markets get more competitive, you're going to either going to be prepared for it or you're going to learn yeah. the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. Automation seems to be, it needs a huge improvement in the U S market amongst operation operators right now is what I'm reading between the lines. Would you agree with that? I think there's many operators that are absolutely on top of it. Um, and, um, many that really need to get focused. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, I want to talk about Nova. Um, they had some pretty good results last week. You actually are their largest shareholder with 35 million shares. Nova Cannabis announced the latest financials last week that saw the company earn a positive net income, which needless to say is pretty rare in the Canadian market. What was your reaction when they reported a positive net income? So we, we do take a brief moment to pause and celebrate wins. Um, you know, not many W's to point to in this industry. So yeah. Um, having you know both entities that 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 we manage um, put up um, positive free cash flow and to see Nova with a positive EPS print, yeah, um, yeah. clearly a, a great great milestone. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, we we see more to come there. Nova's really reached an inflection point on scale, yeah, where um, added doors are bringing um, uh, a phenomenal translation to bottom line cash flow. And so we're, we're looking at gaps that we have in the marketplace and location specific opportunities in addition to um, some small uh, M&A that we think could benefit the model going forward. Um, but clearly the, the the value buds convenience driven model uh, is resonating with consumers. Where is that acquisition right now? Because that was originally announced back, what was it last December? And I know there's been some dates that have extended, but for all of our viewers out there, when it comes to that acquisition, um, are you confident that you know the closing will happen relatively soon? Like where's it sit right now? So Shad, just to be clear, it's, it's actually not an acquisition, it's a reorganization. Okay. So we were planning to reorganize our relationship, restructure our relationship with Nova. Today, there's a subsidy coming from SNDL that, that helps benefit um, the minority interest that we don't own. We're a 63% owner of, of, uh, of Nova today. Um, we've also provided financing and helped to grow the business. Our uh, our plan uh, has been to um, amalgamate all of our Canadian retail license um, ownership into Nova, yep. uh, and also take the unique position that SNDL is in with, on last count, over a million individual shareholders because of our retail base, and effectively in dividending that Nova equity out to them, we could create a scenario where um, we could really sort of jump the shark effectively yeah. in in creating um, step function change in the trading liquidity and profile of Nova, um, resulting in better access to capital. And if you just think about it, how many micro cap names you know, get the chance to become mid caps, right? It's, 
It's um, yeah. it's few and far between. And so <laughs> you think? we think that with some of the dynamics that are in place, um, that are very unique with our with our collective companies and relationship, we would have the ability to um, um, create an interesting growth path for for Nova going forward. Um, are we confident? I would say that anytime we're dealing with regulators, we we need to be conservative and um, you know slightly paranoid. Um, we have gone through six extensions um, in this process, monthly extensions, um, the latest of which um, expires at the end of November. And so we're looking forward to updating investors. Um, but as there are five discussions with with regulators and um, you know multiple multiple parties involved here with their own independent board representation, um, I'm going to hold off on any more detailed commentary until yeah. we have something to to offer in terms of a firm resolution. I think uh, a lot of investors must like your approach. You're a realist that doesn't, you know, sugarcoat a lot of things and fabricate in anything, you know, most CEOs can't, but you're a realist that just basically speaks the truth. Do you get a lot of feedback amongst your investor base based off of that? <laughs> it's a great question. You know, it depends on the day. Um, so we... In this industry, right? As as, as leaders, we we. But that's we a pretty honest them. question when you talk about the regulators, right? Like it's 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 great to see that you know you're being straight up and honest with your shareholders, which they want in this day and age, which is transparency. But anyway, sorry, finish your to thoughts. attract. Listen, to attract the best quality of investor and deliver the best results, we have to. It's not optional. Yeah, we have to have a best in class compliance culture. We take our obligations very seriously. You know, we're producing products in in almost farmer grade environments in Canada. Um, that are being consumed, um, you know, by the public, and so we take those obligations very, very seriously. Um, and so it's 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 not really a choice for us. But yeah. um, have uh, have have I been pushed, you know, by investors to be more promotional at times? Yes, that's really not our style. We're we're trying to let our numbers speak for themselves and execute, and yeah. you know, just do what we say we're going to do. And I think that the the challenges um, and uh, <clears throat> and 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 difficulties that the cannabis space has globally, but specifically in North America. You know, these are the best times to build relationships as you um, you see companies and people challenged and in, in the worst of scenarios, right? And, Agreed. And, um, we, we think it's a phenomenal opportunity and time frame to build trust and solid relationships with counterparties. Yeah, I hear you there. So with the with, with the current retail footprint you have in Canada, I mean, with, with, the, with the closing down the road of the Nova partnership, um, I mean, is there a certain number that you get to in the Canadian space where you're like, all right, we have enough retail or is the plan to kind of buy and build on an as needs basis? And if you still, we still see the Canadian market growing at the rate it is, you'll just continue to add retail um, until there's, I guess, a point of saturation. That's a great point, Anthony. There will be a point of saturation. Um, hard to tell when that's going to be. If you yeah. back out government managed retail today, um, including Quebec, our retail network's touching about um, just over nine cents of every dollar of cannabis that's sold in Canada. Wow. Should, that, okay. should we be taking that to 15, 20 cents? Yes, we should. Do we believe that um, this industry, like almost every other industry in Canada, is going to take the form of an oligopoly in, in, in some way? Yes, we do. Um, so there's, there's more work to do here. Um, you know, clearly with the saturation that you've seen in almost every major market, uh, major urgent market in Canada, um, there, there are limits as to how many doors you can open organically, uh, but yeah. further consolidation is coming and um, you still have a situation where over half of the retail doors in Canada are really in independent hands. And I think you're going to see that transfer to larger banners um, on a continued basis over the next several years. Huh. Okay. And then you had mentioned that um, the products right now, some are being made in almost um, pharma um, grade facilities. Is that a function of assets that you've picked up? Um, via acquisition, or are you do you, are you kind of seeing down the road that these products are going to need to be made in pretty much an EU GMP uh, grade facility um, as per like mandates by either the U.S. or Canada moving forward? I would I would park the EU GMP um, discussion. Um, certainly that okay. that rises to that level, but this yeah. is all really driven by Health Canada um, regs at the end of the day. Okay, certain standards of safety and operation that are mandated. Um, the, the way, like if you walk facilities across the U.S., um, which, which I know you do versus Canada, you'll see um, you'll see different practices. You'll see different reliance on PPE. You'll oh, see, yeah. you'll see um, yeah. in certain cases, biomass being walked off the floor. 
um, of, of, of grow sites in the U.S. So mm. Canada is a different environment, and you really have to see it to 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 understand it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Not to not to name names, but yes, I've seen some very very different levels of facilities. Um, ones that I would definitely consume product from. Others that's left a uh, lot of question marks. Yeah, we've come a lo- to say the least. We've come a long way though, haven't we, Zach? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I want to continue on uh, the Canada narrative. Uh, in your release, you made updates on your cultivation facility in Alberta, where you'll announce that you'll consolidate all cultivation activities at the, am I pronouncing this correctly, uh, Othoville? Athelville, Athelville, New Brunswick. Yeah. And centralized manufacturing, processing, and production operations in Kelowna, BC. So explain the reasoning behind this. Our facility at Olds was a flagship facility that was conceived of prior to the company's IPO in August of 2019. Okay. Um, and at that time, the view was that there would be a large premium market for cannabis. Um, you know, th- there were many players that I believe confused premium, um, thinking that it was a strategy and not just a, a segment of the market and, and a very small one at that. Right. So um, the, the, the concept in, in some ways made sense uh, because of the individually controlled rooms, but it was conceived of at a time when most of Alberta's um, power was coming from coal fire generation. Okay. And as they've made their um their transition into a different power mix that's greener, more reliant on natural gas and alternatives, you've seen extreme uh, volatility in, in power pricing. And as you would know, three biggest costs in any cultivation and processing operation are people, power, and packaging. And so we saw price spikes um, in Alberta that drove our cash costs of cultivation to unacceptable levels. And so um, that's that's another reason. If you look historically at the biomass impairments that we've yeah, seen, yeah. it's really been um, a representation of this gap between higher cost um, cultivation uh, and uh, market based or, or product based pricing, which was below that. And so um, we have a different risk set up in Affleville, even though it's pure indoor. Um, and relocating our processing um, completely into Kelowna has ramped capacity utilization and enable us to build a bit of a center of excellence on the manufacturing side there. Uh, and when we're going to be using Athelville as um, somewhat of a hedge, it's not going to be responsible for all of our production. Yeah. And in a, in a market that is, um, it's marked by, by over licensing and oversupply at, at many levels, uh, procurement as a strategy is very, very attractive right now. And so we expect to drop well north of a dollar a gram out of our cogs, which is going to flow um, straight to the bottom line. Yeah. Need more people like that in life when it comes to price increase and inflation, people pushing back because a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense right now. I understand it maybe three years ago, but I think it's been overextended, don't you? But that's great that you're pivoting in real time. And that we've been able to, right? And I yeah. sort, of, sort of mentioned on the call is that as we start 2024, you know, that we will not be running a single one of the operational assets that we had just three years ago. Hmm. Interesting to say the least. And that's when you say we've learned a lot, right? We've got the scars to prove it. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, that was an interesting panel I had with you and a few others on the Canadian side, dipping into the U.S. market. But one thing that got my message from you that day on that panel up in Zango is that you're battle tested. And when we look at this U.S. market, and I know there's a lot of speculation with rescheduling taking place, but if that were to happen... What does that do for you, you think, as far as your overall execution plan, as far as like, you know, fast tracking it and bringing it up to speed going into 2024? I get asked all the time whether we're, we're interested in M&A or whether um, change in the, the regulatory landscape in the U.S. is going to accelerate things for us. I'm not sure we can move any faster. I mean, we've, we've taken this business from, you know, struggled to do 10 million a quarter two years ago to bumping up against a quarter billion a quarter. Yeah. Um, we've, we've launched large scale acquisitions, um, and done so successfully. Uh, we've become a dominant cannabis retailer in the span of 24 months yep. in, in Canada. We really need to dial in the fundamentals. So everything from our baseline, um, FP and a capabilities to our control environment, to, um, um, completing our automation initiatives, um, you know, at the, at the, at the processing level. Um, we have so much to work on internally. The good news is that with our balance sheet and with our multi-segment model, we have built a bit of a gravitational pull. And so we are getting unsolicited inbounds for opportunities, um, not just in North America, but globally, 
on a daily and weekly basis. And so we need to stay disciplined and get our house in order so that we can take take on the next leg of growth. Um, certainly, rescheduling is incredibly exciting, right? And 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 especially so in a market like Florida, yeah. where you should see that benefit um, theoretically persist longer than other environments. Um, yeah. But in other cases, and what we saw, you know, what we saw in Canada is, and to some extent in the U.S. with the deferral of of, of taxes, but. You just don't know when the next economic windfall in a very hyper competitive environment is going to be invested in discount, right? Because in some okay. ways it gives you a license to drop prices even further and still compete. And so, um, you know, the, the notion that that this is going to be completed and then all of a sudden, you know, trees are going to grow to the sky. Like, um, yeah, I would say that these markets are going to react very differently. And um, whether it causes them to be flooded with additional um, investor capital or enables companies to get more aggressive on pricing um that's going to take several years to work itself out are you looking at europe at all are you looking at the at the global growth story or like you're laser focused on canadian operations sunstream's doing its thing in the u.s let's dial everything in make sure that the bottom line's performing and then really start to look at the cannabis global growth story i think what what, you know what's the most attractive um point here is just just how Canada is positioned as um, an international um, trade partner. And yeah. so um, looking at distribution options, looking at how much flour is being landed from Canada in various markets yeah. is very appealing to us. And so whether yeah. it's bulk bag flour or finished product, um, and we have, um, you know, we have a scale business in our own brand of products, but we also do a, do a, um, quite a bit of um, B2B business with, um, the top LPs in Canada. We do yes. see a lot of opportunity long term, but uh, looking at winning in Canada first and foremost, and um, excited about you know what we think we can deliver in 2024 when it comes to international activity. Do you see a day where you can actually be able to leverage your Canadian operations south of the border, um, yeah. down in the states, or you think we're way off from uh, from achieving anything close to that? I think we're I think we're way off, but I do think it happens, um, and I think when you look at um, other Schedule Three uh, narcotics and and the way that they're manufactured and um, uh, the way that that trade lanes work globally, um, mm-hmm. there's certainly that opportunity or the implication of it uh, or uh, long term. Yeah, I've got that about on my ten year time horizon with uh, right. in the space. All right, Zach. Well, I asked you about rescheduling earlier and. Uh, if it were to happen, how it would fast track your business. And you said, I really don't know how much quicker we can go. When I look at your, here's a great stat, positive free cash flow of 16 and a half million in the third quarter of 2023 compared to negative 67.1 a year ago at this time. So I think that's a real indicator as to how much, you know, you, you said that the pace that you've been going and the growth of the overall industry and more specifically over your company in the last 12 months. Agreed. Was that, sorry, was that a question? <laughs> yeah. Question, but also a stat, but at the same time, it's just like, it's, it's impressive with what you guys have done, right? Yeah. Look, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but, um, this quarter's results, you know, really, uh, prove out our strategy. We think we're moving in the right direction. There's a lot of optionality, um, embedded in this platform. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to focus on delighting consumers, um, and owning that consumer relationship in all the markets in which we play. Yeah. If you had to make a bold statement for 2024, what would it be? <coughs> Don't like these questions, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that we're going to see rescheduling in 2024. Okay. Which is pretty uh, exciting. I think that's about as exciting and bold as, uh, as I got for you today. Well, I think that's a pretty good, bold statement. Uh, listen, I hope our viewers actually got a chance to enjoy this podcast. If there's anything we missed, any more questions, I'm sure there's probably something, but let us know what it is. We'll reach out to Zach. We'll ask the question. We'll get feedback for you. Uh, Zach, appreciate this. I hope we can continue to do this and keep this conversation going, but I hope this is uh, the first of many podcasts to have you on, but uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, most importantly, Anthony, I just want to say thanks and uh, let's keep in touch. Thanks for your time and attention. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right.
What is up, everyone? What'd you think of the video? Leave a comment below. And as usual, if you want to subscribe to our channel, then click on the link here. If you want to see more videos like this, then click on the link here. As usual, click on that bell right below us to get all the notifications because at the end of the day, TDR sets the narrative because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.